Oops. Well, let me switch this name real quick. What's up, everybody? We back. No, that's not your name. Draco, Dan. Draco, good. And then... Let's see. So... Oop. Yeah, the same paper, like same. All right, and so Draco Dan, man, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being a part of the marathon. Of course, dude. And so, uh, you know, I want to hit you with a quick little bit of an interview, man. So, you know, you've been in the Sonic community forever, speedrunning community in general forever. You've done a lot for Europe, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, like, what got you into speedrunning? What was your first run, and what made you fall in love with it? I mean... This is a question that a question gets asked that gets uh, quite occasionally. Uh, quite There's a couple occasionally. of answers, because I've been into tool-assisted speedrunning for quite a bit longer than RTA speedrunning. Speed speed but um, well, my first involvement with RTA speedrunning was after watching AGDQ 2013. And the first game I actually tried was F-Zero GX. I did um, very hard story mode ILs, essentially. And I got fairly competent at them, but I never did it as like a full RTA run. Sonic Adventure 2 was the first thing I tried to run as a full RTA game. And the way I got into it originally was kind of weird, because a couple of my friends were doing a race of the game, and they were in a Skype call together. That's how old you know it is, because it was back when Skype was active. And I wanted to be in the call, and they were like, no, sorry, only people who are racing the game can be in the call. So I decided to race the game so I could be in the call with them. And then it literally just snowballed from there. Like, in five years, it's gone from me wanting to be in a Skype call to thinking, you know, this is pretty fun, I'm going to keep running this game, to now being one of the top runners and like being the lead moderator for the game. Like, I don't know where all the time's gone, but I'm really glad with all the time that I've spent on this game. Wonderful, man. Well, alright, I am going to get hopped out of the call, and, or I will count you down. Okay. And then, uh, after the count, uh, I will have another call. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so everybody, this is Tony Vita 2, uh, Battle Hero Story by Draco Dan. Enjoy. All right, and so three, two, one, go. All right, so yeah, I'm on my lonesome now. Don't worry, guys, no more echo, because um, I'm not on the call anymore. So yeah, this is Sonic Adventure 2. This is Hero Story. I'm not doing all stories. I'm only doing Hero Story, and in about 40 seconds' time, I will or will not have hit one of the most major skips in the whole run. <laughs> as soon as we get off the boarding section in City Escape, we're going to come up to City Escape Skip, which is a very difficult, some would say like pseudo-random skip, which I'm basically going to give a single attempt at, and I'm just going to carry on without it if I don't get it. This is a very difficult skip. I'm going to need to roll down a hill at high speed and store a spin dash through some speed pads so that they don't interrupt my speed and slow me down too much, and I'm going to be pause buffering to also get a trick jump off the ramp. Alright, I'll get like one ramp jump and carry on if I don't get it after the ramp jump because it's quite easy to miss the um, ramp jump there with the pause buffering. If I miss it this time, then I'm not going to continue trying for this because this is kind of an on-off trick. Like I say, I could get the ramp jump and still not get the skip. If I get it now, it'll still save some time. And I, <laughs> Alright, I got it. <laughs> so, um, this isn't going to save, you know... A whole world of time since I got it third try, but it is still going to save a bit of time relative to doing the stage without the skip. So that is City Escape Skip, and you skip halfway through the stage since you get zipped out of bounds and still manage to land halfway through the stage. And if you do it with high speed, as I did there, you get that nice camera angle, which doesn't let you see anything, but I know how to traverse that rail section without being able to see what I'm doing. And now we go into the truck section. So the truck section lets you see how Sonic's movement really works in this game. You want to be spin dashing as much as possible. And when you're going downhills like this, you want to just let the ball form roll because it just keeps accelerating. And when you're on flat ground like this, you want to keep chaining the spin dashes, and that goes for when you're going uphill as well. Yes. So, a 142 City Escape, that is, as I say, pretty much better than anything you're going to see without the skip, but um, if this was like an actual run, that loses quite a bit of time just from the fact that I got the skip third try. But I got the skip, so there it is. And coming straight out of the Sonic stage, we're going into Sonic's first boss, which is Bigfoot. This is one of the bosses in the game that you can get a potentially frame-perfect timing. Like, this is one of the bosses where you can basically match what the task does if your execution is good enough. 
The perfect time that you can get in this fight is 21.39 seconds. Most of my fights are like a 21.4, 21.5. We'll see what I get here. I'm going to use the front boxes to try and knock into his cockpit as soon as he's available and then just keep trying to get first frame hits on him before he flies off. I think I wasted a frame there. And I missed the last hit. Okay, I just slid right off his hitbox. That can happen. To be fair, I shouldn't have homing attack there, but I'm certainly not getting a frame perfect time now. Either way, though, still a fairly okay fight. Loses a few seconds, but yeah, it's whatever. So we're coming straight into a Knuckles stage now. This game features Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails as your main characters. Sonic and Tails' stages are quite linear. Knuckles' stages are very non-linear, and you've got to find three shards of the Master Emerald, which are randomly generated throughout the stage. And we use these hint monitors. You just saw I got um, near the six pillars as a hint. These let me know where my next Emerald Shard are. Oh my god, I didn't want to take the wind tunnel there. Come on, go back down. Come on. As I'm going through these stages as well, I'm also constantly keeping an eye out for potential free pieces, we call them. Like, I'm using the radar to know where to go next, but if I see any pieces just hanging out in the stage, I can grab them without needing to get a hint. Such as, what is this? This is... <laughs> oh, have I got this hint? This piece even? This is... Yeah, okay. This is a really bad um, <laughs> Wild Canyon time, unfortunately. Uh, some... Really bad execution on pieces 1 and 3, unfortunately, because um, my piece 2 was in a weird spot where every time you grab a hint, unless you get far enough away from the hint monitor to despawn it before it disappears on its own, there is a cooldown between when you grab a hint and when you can grab the next hint. And I grabbed the second piece so quickly that I wasn't able to get a hint monitor immediately. So since I was then already getting a ping, I was trying to detect it hintless, but it was a bit tricky. So here's Tails' gameplay. This is Eggman 1, the easiest boss fight in the game. You just hold up, keep shooting, and he's going to go down pretty quickly in four hits. Yeah, tricky fight. But whilst the boss fight is very easy, uh, Tails' stages are actually not very easy. I think Tails is the hardest character in this game to use proficiently. So we start off with Prison Lane, which is actually a very technical Tails stage. And it does show you like the base fundamental of Tails' movement right away. You can run quite quickly, but if you want to corner, you need to hop around corners like this. Because if you try and corner too sharply while you're on the ground, Tails just loses all his momentum. So this is something that you're going to see me do all the time throughout the run, where if I need to take a corner, I'm going to try and jump around them like that. There are some spots where I can look like I'm turning more sharply on the ground than I actually am by using using the camera, just letting the camera do a lot of the turning for me, but those spots are quite situational. So the gimmick of Prison Lane is that there's a lot of locked doors and gates like this one right here, and they're guarded by groups of enemies, so you need to be constantly destroying enemies to keep progressing through the stage. And you can get a few of them early, such as when I'm going up on this elevator here, there's an enemy that I'm going to target through the wall to open a door early. The lock-ons in this game don't so much care if you have a direct line of sight to an enemy, they just care about specific, like, positional triggers. And some of them are very, very weird. Some of them can also be really awkward as well, like, how did I not get that enemy, for instance? Like I say, some of them are just very weird. So that's a little example of what I mean by letting the camera do some of the turning there for me, but if you overcompensate on the stick too much, then you will just lose all your speed immediately. So there's a couple of tricky early lock-ons I can get here. Well, there's one early lock-on at this corner, which is very tough. Okay, I, no, I didn't get it in time, actually. It was that second enemy there, which um, opens that gate. And one lock-on, which is a little notorious, is getting the enemy at the top there, so that we can do this gate hop and just go through here without needing to target him from the other side of the room. The game expects you to take a um, quite a laborious route to get that last enemy, if you don't do that little exploit there. So a 139, getting a sub 140, you know, for a marathon, it's pretty all right. It's very easy to start rapidly losing time in tail stages. Like, outside of taking a death, there's not too much in terms of mistakes that you make with tails that cost multiple seconds at a time. But there's many, many different ways to make mistakes that can cost, cost like, a fraction of a second. And although that doesn't sound like much, the sheer number of mistakes you can make really starts to add up. So here's Sonic's next stage, Metal Harbor. This is the stage where I'm going to be getting the first upgrade of the game, Sonic's Light Shoes, and these are going to let us light dash across trails of rings. So I'm just going to do some spin dash jumps to cross wide gaps like this first, and skip most of these enemies, take this pulley up, and we get the light dash up here. So I can use the action button when I'm near a trail of rings to just zoom across them like that. 
it's kind of an annoying thing in this game that all of your actions are on the same button. So spin dash, somersault, and now light dash, they're all on the same button. So I just need to use the right action at the right time. It's a little annoying to get used to. Like right there, I didn't want a somersault, but I don't really have control over it. I had a somersault stored, apparently, and the game was like, yeah, you're going to use that. And I didn't have enough momentum to make that gap. That's really strange. See, that, all, that sort of thing all stems from getting like the wrong action at the wrong time and then ending up in a spot that you're not really intending to be. If that happens, then obviously the movement and the muscle memory that you've built up doesn't uh, work and you need to make an adaptation. And the game tried to kill me there by using a loop speed trigger to launch me out the bottom of the loop. Uh, loop speed is a property in this game where it helps you around a loop, essentially, by just giving you a burst of speed downwards. But if you do that while you're in midair um, over a loop like that, then the results can obviously be a little hairy sometimes. And that, there was a sloped spin dash jump to make it straight up to the rocket platform. You can gain a lot of momentum in this game with spin dash jumps, and you can also gain a lot of height with them if you do them from a upwards facing slope. Because the game temporarily skews the direction of gravity, so that gravity is facing more sideways. That can be used for a lot of exploits later in the game as well, which I'll go more into detail with when it's relevant to do so. So one little loop skip here, and straight out of the stage. And we're going to be coming up to one of the most famous cutscenes in the game. The uh, Shadow 1 boss cutscene. Which I'm mostly just going to let speak for itself. I'm not going to interrupt this cutscene. The only thing I'm going to say before it starts is for Shadow, I'm going to be using a different glitch called Storage to basically trick the game into not realising that I'm somersaulting. While I'm holding the B button, um, the game thinks that I'm somersaulting and I can use that to run into Shadow and inflict damage. I'm also going to try and save a quarter of a second here by spin dashing towards Shadow as I gain control. This is a semi tap strat. Okay. Cool, I got a sub 11 fight. So the TAS in that fight gets a 1094. So that was three frames off what the TAS gets. So that was a pretty good fight. That's like probably the best split of the run so far. Like, there's been quite a few hiccups in the run so far, and I'm going to really need to step it up, especially in this stage, since Green Forest has. I mean, City Escape skip was a major skip, but we don't rely on getting that one in marathons because of how, like I say, pseudo-random it can be. One thing that a lot of high runners do go for in this stage regularly, though, is the wall run halfway through the stage. We can use the aforementioned loop speed property to get on the side of the huge tree in the middle of the stage and just run straight up it. And there's a couple of different ways we can then exit from the tree, one of which is called TAS Run. It was originally unveiled in the Hero Story TAS from a few years ago. And we've since found RTA viable ways to be able to do it. That's the way that I like to do wall run if I can. So when I get there, it is one of the most difficult tricks you can perform in this run. And I'm not consistent at the trick, but I get it a fair amount of time. So it's probably like um, City Escape Skip. I'm going to give it a couple of attempts. And if I'm really struggling with it, I'll just carry on without it. Pretty okay so far though. Green Forest is an irritating stage where there's a lot of like micro slopes that can just launch you into the air, such as this one right here. Thankfully I stuck to the floor there, but any like slope like that where you crest over a hill, you can just launch into the air and that loses time because Sonic is pretty much always slower in the air than he is on the ground. So I'm coming up to it here, I'm gonna really focus on this for a sec. That's not going to work. Well, okay, I'm just going to bail out with this. I'm just going to run up the tree and get a ghetto exit at the top of the tree. So, what happened there was, uh, like I say, I used the loop speed trigger there. By getting on the side of the loop and skewing gravity... Please get on the side there, Sonic. So yeah, by skewing gravity there, I homing attacked into the loop speed trigger, which immediately forced me downwards, which the game was still interpreting as sideways. So then I was able to land on the vertical surface of the tree while I had enough speed to still stick to it because you can wall run on pretty much any surface in this game as long as you have enough speed and you only fall off it once you like hit a vertex in a weird way to make you become airborne or when you become slow enough for the game to just reset gravity manually. If I'd been able to land on a different part of the tree I would have been able to attempt the Tasseron trick which is um, jumping off the tree halfway up and then using a small gravity exploits to try and make it straight to the next part I was going for, but getting up the tree at all is not too bad. Like, I got it first try. 
And so coming into Pumpkin Hill now, this is quite a bit more volatile as an RNG stage than Wild Canyon was. Uh, the stage is a lot bigger, and I have to pick up an upgrade here, the Shovel Claws, which lets me dig underground. The game's always going to give me a third piece, which is underground, to make sure I pick this up. And there are some hints which share the same name, so... Okay, this is always in the same spot, this is at Church Mountain, but there are a couple of pieces in this stage where I can get hint text and it can refer to more than one location. So let's see what I get, piece two. Triangle, this is always in the same spot as well. This is quite a good piece. These pieces are quite good so far. Especially if I get a third piece that's near my current location. There's a hint right here as well, so I can get moving immediately after my second piece. King of Hill. Okay, this is not a very good piece, because it's all the way at this pumpkin mountain in the distance here. This is about as far away as it could have been. But this is still going to be an average set, because the first two were actually quite good. So I prefer to just fly into the enemy and then drill dive, so that I can't drill dive into the enemy and risk getting knocked to the side, because when you destroy that enemy, he typically drops an explosive, which can explode on you if you miss the piece, which loses some time, and if you don't have any rings then it can just kill you straight up. But as long as you glide into the enemy first, he's not gonna knock you anywhere when you drill dive, so I find that a lot more consistent for grabbing that piece. So that was a pretty decent pumpkin hill, and uh, now we're coming into Mission Street. So Mission Street is a very cycle-based stage. First of all, I'm gonna be picking up Tails' upgrade, the booster, which is gonna let us use the hover, which I'm immediately gonna use for a glitch called the hover jump, where I'm going to try and pause buffer the two inputs to get them as close together as possible so that I can boost my height, and that lets me get a little higher than possible. It's not like too much of a difference, but it's enough of a difference to let me get to spots that I'm not supposed to be able to access, like an early cycle on this weight right here. So I'm gonna pause buffer when this weight starts rising. And I just messed up my unpause there. So I need to do like A, pause, and then pause A, so that I'm simulating two A inputs as close together as possible, but I must have done the um, last two inputs simultaneously. So unfortunately I didn't read the hover. If I was, if I did that properly, then I'd have been able to get onto that weight and ride it up, and I'd basically be saving a cycle here, and it would let me go for an earlier cycle later in the stage as well, which we call zero cycle. As it is right now, the best I can go for is first cycle. Which, at this point, is quite lenient, thankfully. Like, if you're just on standard first cycle pace, then you can make quite a lot of mistakes going through the stage and still be on pace to get it. So that was a hover jump that I did just there. I pause buffered again to get straight over the cage. And now, as long as I move decently with no major mistakes, I should be getting first cycle without too much difficulty. So we're just going to ride this weight elevator up. So that's zero cycle going up there, so you can see that like you're absolutely not making that without the um, first cycle, as it were. Or without getting the weight hop, I mean. So we're just going to take this cycle. This is the um, previous first cycle. Like, um, zero cycle originated as another pass only trick, so the reason we call it zero cycle is because it obsoleted what we thought was the fastest possible cycle. But we didn't want to rename the cycles, so we simply added a faster one. <laughs> that's the way it goes, right? So this is going to be approximately a 218 Mission Street now. Like, a, a decent first cycle without squeezing any IGT on the upgrade is going to be about a 218. Just blast these obstacles out the way. And once we get out of Mission Street, it's going to be entering a very volatile RNG stage, Aquatic Mine. Um, Aquatic Mine is actually pretty much the smallest RNG stage. Um, 217 is actually quite good. Uh, without the, um, It's even better than 218. But... Um, I think in total size of where you're generally going to go, in most cases, Aquatic Mine tends to be smaller than Wild Canyon even. But there are a lot of free pieces that you could potentially look out for, which can make the stage potentially very fast if you're lucky. So it makes bad RNG consequently a lot worse. And there's a couple of very awkwardly placed pieces which can force quite a bit of time loss, or make you play very precisely. So I'm watching the intro cutscene here to see if I get any free pieces. I don't see any so far. Alright, I don't see any. There's a couple more that I can get in the top room, though. Okay, and I've got a ping, so this is somewhere near the bottom, if it's pinging only for an instant. And I don't see any free pieces, so I haven't got any free pieces, sadly. Right, where am I going? Probably... Okay, this is a free piece I could have potentially gotten if I'd just taken a different free piece checking route, because it is back up in this top room that I was in, and this is a piece that a lot of runners do choose to check for with a slightly different route. You just break this cart and sometimes this piece is there. So this... This is going to be tricky. Um, this can be a good piece if it's there, but if it's at the back here, there's a very precise grab for this without the water level. 
and I got it first try. <laughs> that is a hell of a lot more precise than I made it look, getting it without the water level just there. Um, if it's the one that's further along in the path, you can just jump off the wall and glide, and you'll clip the bottom of the piece, no problem. You can't do that with that piece. It's quite a bit higher up, and it's blocked by the ceiling that was right in front of me. So there's a lot of ways that you can jump for that piece and just never get high enough. But with a very, very precise spot, you can jump away from the wall and then hold down. And you'll just about miss the ceiling that's in front of you, so you'll keep rising. With enough forward momentum to just clip the bottom of that piece. But that is really, really difficult to get that. And I'm surprised that I got that first try. I haven't had a lot of time to practice that. So this is uh, Route 101. It's kind of a breather in the middle of the run. A lot of runners kind of view it as. Because it's quite simplistic. There's not honestly too much going on. The only piece of tech that's really being exploited throughout this stage is that... I'm drifting back and forth like I'm wiggling. This is to keep tails in the drift state, and this makes it so that as long as I'm drifting, I'm not gonna fall below the boost speed cap, because you have the normal driving speed, and you have the speed that you get when you use a boost. But, um, like, you normally return back to the normal speed, but as long as you're drifting like this, the only time I'll actually decelerate from the boost speed is when I go up a hill or if I collide with a wall or a car. So for the most part, I'm just going to be drifting to keep my speed, and then after I'm forced to take certain uphill sections, I'm going to be using boosts to get back up to my regular boost speed. Like, after this uphill, I'm going to use a boost once I land. And then I'm going to get my next boost right here. And these pit stop balloons will pretty much always give you a boost as well. So, a uh, low 119 without exploiting um, a particular ring route that can get you an extra boost is quite a healthy time. Like, this is quite a good Route 101. So, intentionally bonk off the wall so I can take that double corner a little bit safer, and it helps you get around it quite sharply, actually. Like, you see that I got around it so sharply that I actually hit the inside of the next turn, which is quite uncommon. But I'm still going quite fast. Okay, I uh, don't have my boost yet, but this next ring trail will definitely give me the boost. Just dodge this red car. Nice. Yeah, this is a really nice time, actually. Because I'm going to easily beat this blue car out of here. The cars are pretty much always in the same spot. Like, it just depends on the timer. So there's no RNG in where the cars are, so as long as you can know where you are based on the timer, you'll always be able to predict where the cars are. That helps you really plan what your current route should be. And that's a low 2.14 time. For the route that I was using in Route 101, that is actually a very good time. So I'm definitely not unhappy with that. So, definitely entering the um, most technical part of the run right here. The run is like divided into several sections, a lot of people think. But these three stages here are the desert stages. We've got Tails' Hidden Base, Sonic's Pyramid Cave, Knuckles' Death Chamber. For each respective character, I believe, and a lot of runners also believe, that these are the most difficult stages. There's certainly like the most back-to-back -back tricks that aren't just a major level skip that you do in these stages. Like, um, Hidden Base is pretty much hover jumps the stage. There's a couple of different routes you can use in this section, but I'm using a fairly pedestrian uh, entry level method, which is very consistent and only a couple of seconds slower than the fastest possible method, which needs an almost frame perfect pause hover, so that's totally fine. I'm happy to eat a couple of seconds for the sake of never really missing this route. So we can you just use hovers to cross wide gaps like this. Need to destroy these dynamite packs to get the platforms down as soon as possible, and I am going to be using a pause buffer here to try and get a lot of height on this jump. So I missed that one as well. I'm really doing bad with pause buffers lately. Thankfully, missing that one only costs about a second, because I need to take that slightly wider path than I did there. The idea is that with a perfect hover jump, I'd just be able to go straight over and not need to do any turning whatsoever. That only saves about a second, though. So we're just carrying on here. This is still going to be... I think this is going to be a 113 checkpoint, which is still not bad. 112 checkpoint, even better. Alright, so there's a couple more hover jumps I'm going to be doing here. I don't need to buffer these, but if I miss these, then it will just kill me and I'll restart from that checkpoint because of the quicksand here. Okay, good. And good. My PB took a 20 second death there, so <laughs> I'm fourth place on the leaderboards right now. The leaderboard has like 570 times on it. I'm fourth place, and if I hadn't taken a death there from missing an input, I would be second place right now, so wow. 
Sometimes it's just like that. But for using a pretty basic route there, 146 is a very respectable hidden base time. Certainly not going to complain about that. Coming up though is Sonic's Pyramid Cave I mentioned before, and this is by far the most technical and difficult stage in the game. Like, discounting the fact that the later space stages have major skips, which are difficult because they're major tricks, just playing this stage is very difficult. There's a lot of technical stuff going on, and virtually every single section of the stage can be viewed as a technical trick in itself. Like right here I'm trying to ride the slopes in a specific way to keep my speed high, and then every section after you just have stuff like this, for instance, and you just have all sorts of stuff you can do. Like, I'm gonna go down into this pit, get into the corner here, and get a huge bounce upwards, so that I can take this top path here. And as soon as we're back to relative normality, I'm gonna pick up Sonic's next upgrade, the bounce bracelet, which lets us suddenly do this. So that's a super bounce. If you bounce before you hit a wall in this game, contacting the wall converts all of your horizontal momentum into vertical momentum. So if you spin dash towards a wall and then bounce before you hit it, you suddenly go upwards as fast as you were going forwards. Which, it's as exploitable as it sounds, because you can spin dash to get up to max speed very quickly in this game. There's a lot of places where you can just suddenly go extremely fast and get over walls that you were never supposed to be able to do. Uh, super bouncing, or just bouncing in general, can also be used to augment... Um, an internet connection is required, thanks. That happens when the game tries to connect to the Steam servers, which no longer exist. Alright, so to get back on what I was trying to say before, <laughs> the bounce can also be used to augment uh, gravity skews, so I can keep gravity held in a different direction for a little bit of time, so that I can basically fall almost horizontally in certain spots like that. I'm going to be doing one more of those at the very end of the stage here. I need to do one more super bounce after I get through this door, and then I need to do one more gravity bounce. Okay, I'm glad I just about got over the hill there. So I'm gonna get inside of this loop and do one more gravity bounce, just straight across here. All right, that was actually a bit of a hairy Pyramid Cave. I mean, this is kind of the nature of Pyramid Cave. That probably looked very hype and whatnot, but a 145 is not a particularly good time for me. A really clean Pyramid Cave for me is in like the 130 region, but certain things went wrong in that stage. It's a tricky stage, don't blame me. There was that one section after getting through the second long hallway where I took ages to get up because of things happening. So here's Death Chamber. Oh, I've already got a green ping. What is this? Three container brothers. Okay, I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for a couple of what we call confirmed sets. Depending on what my um, piece two is, I could have a guaranteed piece three, and it can be very good. Sniper, that's not a confirmed set as far as I know, but this is still a good piece too, because it's just over here. This is a very good set so far. So, what's my third piece? Red light. Oh wow, this set is really good. <laughs> I am barely having to do any traveling in this stage. I'm just going through to the core, through to blue, and then into this next hallway. This is a very good time. <laughs> that was with execution mistakes throughout as well. Don't kill me. Okay. <laughs> 44 Deathless. That is a very good Death Chamber time. That's just really good RNG. I didn't even get to mention about how in Death Chamber we commonly use Death Strats. Which is to say, because of the way the game generates the pieces, the second piece is always going to be far away from where the first piece was. So if you get a piece one that's very far from the starting location, you can just kill yourself after you pick it up. The game will respawn you in the starting spot with piece one already collected, and you have a high chance of respawning with the second piece being in the red room, so you can basically get a teleport to your next piece. That's something that we commonly exploit. So I'm gonna try a very precise skip here called Fireball Skip. I'll say skip, but I'll give it one more try. I messed it up as well. I need to bait Boom Boo into attacking me, still have enough speed to get away from him, and then I need to backtrack towards him when he bounces back. And then by digging in a precise couple of ways, we can just get straight behind him and get the hourglass like that. That about breaking even with if I didn't do fireball skip at all, getting it second try. So now the meat of the fight is getting the one cycle here. Um, normally Boom Boo's meant to move too quickly for you to keep up with, but if your movement's very precise and you have a very precise spot that you're attacking him in, you can just keep hitting him in one cycle like that without needing the fight to go on for multiple minutes, which saves a hell of a lot of time. So, 
Coming straight out from King Boom Boo, which is the second hardest boss in the game, we come into Egg Golem, which is the hardest boss in the game. Can use the same super bounces as in Pyramid Cave, but these platforms are very narrow, and when I said um, that you need to bounce before you hit a wall, that is specific terminology. The bounce needs to come out before you contact a wall. These walls are very close to where you start off, and there's no more than like four or five frames to get these bounces off. And I just got basically three in a row, which is a perfect fight. So those are like combinations of almost frame perfect inputs, and I just got a bunch back to back, which is one of the most mechanically demanding things you can do in this run. <laughs> And then I completely messed up the last hit from trying to get greedy. Sucks. And I'm gonna die in the sand to stop the in-game timer early and artificially save a bit of time. Not bad. So, <laughs> despite all of the stuff so far in the run, like, you know, some of it's looked pretty tricky. There's been some technical stuff going on. These are the space stages. All of these have major skips. All of these are very difficult slash temperamental. Like, the, the stages before the desert stages are very technical in terms of playing the stages, but these skips can absolutely make or break a run, and some of them are extremely volatile, such as the one I'm about to do here. I like to call it external engine. I'm going to run at the boxes in a specific way, and try and jump and shoot simultaneously, and get straight out of bounds like that. First try, very nice. That is very unreliable to get that first try, especially in a marathon setting. Because you need to break those boxes and then have the metal box fall on top of you while you're under it, you only get a single attempt at that. Like, if you fail it, then you can try on the boxes on the other side of the room, but then if you still don't get it, you need to die to reset the room. So that skip starts very quickly bleeding time. And now that I'm straight out of bounds, I'm just going to fly straight towards the Goron. There is no more regular gameplay in the stage. I'm literally just flying to the end of the stage because the end of the stage is far below where the start of the stage is. So the camera is inverted and all I can do is rely on a couple of vague background cues. You may be thinking, what background? And you're kind of right, but I've got enough information to work with. In about five seconds I'll hear the goal ring. There we go. Just being a bit conservative there to make sure I don't miss the goal ring. If you fall past the goal ring and it's very easy to miss it there, you just die because there's a kill plane below you. And then you need to start from before you got the clip out again. So it's really, really bad to not only lose all that time, but to then need to get the clip out again. Because I made the clip out look very easy, but it can be anything but easy. Whew, rough run. <laughs> so here's the last RNG stage, Meteor Head. This... I mean, it can be a volatile stage, but this is actually my favourite RNG stage to play. The movement is very simple in this stage. Most of the time you're moving at a set speed from either just uh, gliding like this, or taking a rocket up, or drill diving down to a lower part of the stage. So a container within a container is an okay first piece. It's over here, in this area. I'm just going to go over here for my second hint which is Twin Stars, this is at the bottom. Hopefully I just don't get a piece 3 now that's at the top of the stage again, because it does take quite a while to go back up. And that's one of the worst last pieces I can get. That is at the top of the stage, and I'm then going to need to come back down. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> but this is very bad RNG. Almost any other last piece would have been preferable to this. The only other last piece that would have been as bad is, like, um, gun um, surrounded by spinner containers. But this is, like, ugh. Container at the top of the arc is also a very bad last piece, but yeah, those three are like the worst that could have turned up there. 50 is definitely not a very good Meteor Herd. It actually pretty much matches what I have in my PB, but this is the only RNG stage in my PB that just wasn't very good because I got bad luck. So that's all the RNG over in the run. Well, you can argue that the bosses have some RNG, but it's very minor. A lot of it is controllable, and this fight is a good example of that. This fight is meant to be very erratic, where Rouge just runs around and is very difficult to track down. But if I just go for her as soon as I gain control and just keep jumping around her, her AI is going to remain very passive and I'm going to be able to finish her off below 15 seconds. Easy fight, every time. <laughs> so, there's been a lot of hard stuff done in the run. But we are coming up on the most difficult trick in the run. Um, I think this is the most difficult trick. Some people disagree between this and the Green Forest Wall Run, but this is Crazy Gadget Skip Skip, or CGSS. I'm going to need to 
change gravity, which is normal for this stage, get in a precise spot, uh, do a fully charged spin dash jump out of bounds, weave between multiple kill planes, and then fall in the ring whilst I can't see where I'm going. If it sounds difficult, it's because it is difficult. This is like the holy grail of swaggy and advanced and fast tricks in the game. And I really hope I get this first try, so I'm already going to just show up and start stealing myself for this. This is very difficult. Alright, so I think I just didn't get my jump in put off in time there. I jumped, but I like immediately hit a kill plane, so I think I was just too close to the edge of the ledge there, because there's a kill plane that's at the bottom of that ledge. That time I just jumped up too high. I'm kind of rushing my setup for this. I'm gonna focus a little more on what I'm doing on this attempt. Alright, I'm out of bounds. So now I just need to do this fall into the goal ring while I can't see where I'm going. Again, I've only got some vague background cues to go off. And we're in. So the first genuine like jump that I got, I got out of bounds and it was fine. So yeah, kind of sucks that I took a couple of deaths there, but it was a bit silly that I was rushing my setup like that. But you can see just um, how easy it is to lose time there in a run. Like I say, that's one of the most difficult tricks you can do. At a high level run, you probably need to get that first try to PB, unless you've already got deaths on it in a PB to um, save some time on. So the pressure's really on at that point. So here's Eggman 2. This is like the casual Slayer boss of the game, in my opinion. But in a speed run, he's no problem. Let's just kill him like within 15 seconds. Whoa, what is that? Eggman ain't shit. He even got me in a really weird spot and I still corrected because I'm just that good. Alright, so coming up on the final stage here. Final rush. Just like Crazy Gadget and Eternal Engine, we skip virtually all of the stage. You've seen uh, gravity exploits a little bit so far in the run. This is by far the biggest example of a gravity exploit. Most of this stage takes place on rails, and rails can also be used to skew gravity. So once I get onto the next rail here, just going to jump off it with some inverted gravity, and by falling in a specific direction, I can keep this gravity skewed, so currently I'm almost falling sideways. And the idea here is that if I fall in a very specific direction, I can fall around every kill plane in the stage and still have enough height to then start falling towards the goal ring and just go straight to the end of the stage. I turned too early there and actually hit the kill plane, that's uncommon. I'm gonna need to pay close attention to when the camera pans around here, when it happens, so one, two, three, four, five, yeah, 35. I'm gonna reset gravity at 35.5 to be very safe. Because the angle that I'm using, it goes closer to the kill planes, but it results in me having more height at the end, which if I'm conservative on this left turn, it makes it very safe to get to the end of the stage. Like, I've fallen slightly further away from the goal ring, but I've got so much spare height to play with that I'm still going to reach the end of the stage quite easily. So there's just about 20 more seconds of falling in this direction, and then we'll soon be home free. Yeah, there's not too much to commentate at this point. You just have to trust that I'm falling in the right direction. I am also still falling in the right direction to not only make it to the end of the stage, but avoid another kill plane. Like, you see these three pillars here, this is the end of the stage. Behind the center of this se central pillar is another kill plane, so I'm going around the right-hand side just to make sure I don't hit it. Because that's, uh, you really don't want to take a death there after spending so long doing the skip. All right. Yeah. So all we've got now in the run is Shadow 2. The last fight of the run, time is when I inflict the fifth hit on Shadow. That's when the in-game timer stops, and that is when the run timing stops. This game is in-game time, it's just the sum of the level times. So time is when the in-game timer stops for the final time. I said time a lot of times there. <laughs> Alright. So Shadow can potentially be annoying, but there's a pretty consistent way to just keep him locked down with rhythmic homing attacks. One more. And time. 
So, according to my timer, which is accurate to the frame, that is a flat 37. Well, 37.00.68 seconds. So, not one of the best marathon runs I've ever done, but I had absolutely no prep time for this. I was just, I got home from work, I took a shower, then uh, Fat Body was like, yo, do a run. I'm like, alright, yes sir, boss. And this happened. Th you know, there was a lot of sloppy stuff. Third try C um, CGSS. No, it was third try CGSS. Third try CE skip. Didn't get a task run. A lot of stuff went wrong, but a lot of stuff also went right. And I think this was a pretty alright run. Hope everyone enjoyed. And if you're at all interested in running this game, do please join the Sonic Speedrunning Discord. Where we have a very active community. There's a lot of people who'd love to help you learn this run, myself included. So, I think I'm just going to give it back over to Fatbody so that we can get moving with the next run of the event. Thank you guys very much. Sonic and that shit-eating grin. All right, y'all. So I am back in here. All right, so I am back in here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we don't have Draco in a call or anything. Draco, thank um, you so much. We don't much have Draco in a call or anything. Draco, thank you so much for doing the run. Um, we are going to be setting up for a first. Um, we are going to be setting up for a first two fifteen. Um, oh, of course, now Draco, oh, course, so now now Draco my is in the call. Oh my god! So let me mute my mic. Draco, I'll, I'll that was a... what? No, no, no. Stay. You're good. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, how how do you think about the run and everything? It was pretty up and down, but the parts that were good were really good, so I'm not going to compl complain too much. I missed a lot of stuff, but a lot of stuff looked really cool as well. It's difficult to play when you're commentating. Yeah, no, I definitely understand, man. Well, uh, you know, everybody, be sure to follow Draco's twitch.tv slash Draco Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys should do that. Uh, show my man some love. And so we're going to be setting up for a first 215 with Josh Wigfall, Marvel 2 Legend. So we will be back here in just a little bit. See you soon.